So how do I know when I'm done this? I'm just, as I noodle around, adding details and details and details and details and stuff like that. How do I know when I'm, when I'm done? You know, and I think to me that uh, one way I kind of when I'm working on something like this that's just got so much information, there's two major things I'm looking for, uh, like just in terms of deciding, you know, whether or not something is done or not. The first is um, overall, do I feel do I when I look at the whole piece as a whole and I think about everything going on in this scene, is there any area where I feel um, there's information missing. Do I feel like one area is overworked and another one isn't? The second thing I look for is overall composition. Does the overall piece function? Um, and the last thing that I that I very generally ask myself, well, then I also ask myself, is it fun? Is it, a, is it an exciting piece of artwork or not? Uh, that's another thing. And the other thing is, um, uh, the last thing is, um, as a composition, compositionally, is it solid? You know, like, is is it a solid piece, or do I feel like certain areas are too strong, other areas aren't strong enough type of idea? So these are little things that I generally consider overall. Do I feel like certain, like the lack of detail in certain areas or the lack of information in certain areas, does that, um, uh, does that, uh, is it an eyesore? You know, remember when people are looking at your, when people are watch, looking at your work, they're very often thinking, they're very often, a person is kind of hardwired to see what does not work in a painting. People are a lot better at spotting, just intu intuitively. You don't necessarily have to be an artist to, to have this ability, right? Why is this painting darker? It's almost as if my brush setting is different. There we go, that's better. Um, intuitively, we can tell if something, you know, we can see that certain areas are really exciting to look at. You know, like if I was to if I was to look at this piece of artwork from my own perspective, I would think that this area has a lot of fun information going on, and this area might feel a little bit bland. So I need to add a little bit more something going on here, just to kind of balance it. You know, flip. That's where flipping your piece comes in handy too, because you can really feel this. Um, you can really quickly gauge if uh, what does not what works and what doesn't because you can kind of get stuck you can kind of bottleneck yourself into a certain um you know in a comfort zone and then when you look back at the overall piece you go oh shit you know there's this this piece needs a little bit more work you know like there's certain areas that are overpowering other pieces of work but if you can look at your entire piece and feel comfortable everywhere when you're working on a piece like this like a very a very dense uh, uh concept city type of scape or village or whatever the case might be if you find that everything kind of holds its own ground as an as a, a whole piece then you're probably on the right track you know you probably got something good and you can call it at that point you can say okay i'm good i'm happy with this of course um, another good practice something that i always try to do if i if i have the luxury of doing it because if you're working for a client it's not necessarily something you can do but um, um if you're working on a personal piece, one of the, the nice things about working on a personal piece is that you can put it down for a day, you know, or put it down for half a day or whatever the case might be, and just shift your focus on over to other things. And when you come back and have that first glance at your work again, you can immediately spot if there's something that doesn't work, you know. But with experience, like if you have, as you, when you have more practice with this kind of stuff, with experience, you learn to be able to kind of refresh your thought process while working on something, right? So as I'm working on this, I can take a step back and say, okay, I can see something that doesn't work, you know? But very often something I do need to revisit in my work is color balances and all of that stuff like that. Uh, that's generally the thing that pops out to me. The first thing that's gonna pop out to me if anything's missing in a piece is the color scheme. Did I give that, a, did I give it its due attention or does it need a little bit more? Does it need a little bit more something? And you know what I think this does need? I need a little structure here. Kind of balance the weight of this. There's a lot of density in here. And here there's a little bit too much negative space. So I think I'm going to come in and add a little structure here. Just a little something to gently overlap this one we've got going on here. However, I have to be conscious of the fact that I have a light source in there. So I'm going to be very suggestive with it. Just gonna sample a local value and take the take it down a little bit. I have that little 
little bit of an overlap going on to give a little bit more depth to that part of the scene. But I'm going to be conscious not to paint over my light source here. So to in order to get that, I'm going to use my airbrush to erase so that there's a soft transition. I'm going to take the value down a little bit just to give a little bit more depth. I'm, I'm balancing left and right. A little bit of a color shift. I don't you see if I do the violet, then I'm competing with this. So I want that vi that violet is a key component to this entire piece. I don't want to compete with that, but I do want to bring a new color into this piece to keep the energy moving. I'm going to break this color scheme up a little bit by shifting it around a little bit. It's kind of how I've been approaching the whole piece altogether. And it's at points like this that color starts to become a very intuitive thing to you. You know, your brain, your brain, how you individually, how you, the colors you, your eyes want to see and what you bring in uh, is entirely personal, you know, and respect your intuition. Intuition plays a very important role when it comes to color because it's, that's where you start to find your own signature style come through, you know, how you treat colors. That's almost something we, 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 as artists, you don't want to, you don't want to fight that intuition. You don't want to go, oh, so-and-so's colors are so much better than mine. The more I feel that you respect your own vision, very often the more, in the end, you find something that really um, that really resonates you know, with you and really resonates with your audience as well. So it's just from experience. It's just what I've experienced through, the, through my own trials and tribulations. value test, control, uh, copy, paste, merged, and then control shift U to desaturate the image. I think it needs a bit more value. Yeah, just take it down a notch. There we go. Should help. Now I just use my airbrush here to bring it into the light a little bit more. I'm paying attention to the direction of my light beam. a very therapeutic way to work because you're not sitting there going oh shit you know like uh, right here you can see that I'm not I'm my focus is far more on depth than perspective you know overlapping shapes to create a sense of depth now I do know I do understand I mean as artists most of us you know it's kind of a fundamental we all have to pick up but perspective isn't my real strong point never has been I find that one of the issues you probably run into this issue as well if you're somebody that kind of faces the same thing is um and let me know. I'd love to know on the if you post it on the forums. I'd love to know if you have any ways that kind of help you get past this intimidating aspect of perspective. Is that I find that when I'm when I uh, when I focus too much on geometry and perspective, it really kills my creativity. Where with other artists, that's not really an obstacle for them. And that probably, honestly, I, I think the, the the general response you probably get from that is you just practice. You just have to get comfortable enough with it. I just never really gave myself the chance to give it that much needed attention, you know, and it's definitely something I'm going to be focusing on more. But I have to f find that as artists, you need you need to find those personal tools you need, those little tricks and tips that help you get past certain obstacles that a lot of us have to deal with. And I know there's a lot of really awesome artists out there that also kind of face that same issue. 
it's how to stay creative and loose with your ideas while still thinking in terms of perspective you know and a lot of one of the tricks a lot of artists use in, in that regard is you know they'll they'll do a 3d mock-up on sketchup or uh, you know or maya if you know a 3d program which by the way is not that hard to learn and not anymore it used to be hell but it's not that bad anymore <clears throat> but they'll use a 3d mock-up just to have just so they don't have to worry about it and they can just worry about painting and adding detail and designing it um, which is probably something I would do too, just to get me past that, the, the, you know, so, so I can be more creative with my, my composition and, you know, my camera angles and stuff like that. And I can just focus on designing it and creating something that's nice to look at, you know, but freehand perspective, um, I, I, I really find myself becoming like kind of dealing with that. I'm going back to basics thing. And then I kind of lose sight of my ability to just create so when i'm working very loosely like this i'm uh especially for this type of a this style of piece i uh i find that i can um just express myself and go crazy with design and have fun and create worlds that are a lot more entertaining and not stress myself over technicalities at that particular point point. and one of the things i find you can do a good kind of uh trick that I one trick that does work for me is that if I do work in this particular fashion, oh, somebody's trying to text me. If somebody, if you, if uh, if you do work in this particular fashion, um, one thing you can do is design it first. You know, like worry about the design, even in like just as a <clears throat> just as a kind of rough sketch it out very loosely and ignore the perspective. And then come back in and add the perspective on top. I find when I start creatively first, it allows me to just be free with my ideas. And then I can worry about like the technicalities of perspective and stuff like that after. And I can refine it. That that technique does work for me, but it's a two-step process. You know, with a little bit more experience, I'll be able to just jump straight into pers heavy perspective and still be creative with it at the same time. But I know I have to work on that. But like I said, if you have any good tricks for that, that you know, helped you overcome some of those obstacles. Cause I know a lot of you guys who are listening are, you know, are very strong in that kind of stuff. You do a lot of, you know, more technical perspective work and it's definitely something I want to, I want to refine. But you know, like we do, you know, there's a lot of tricks we can use to get us past that and help us produce things that are a lot, you know, visually more, uh, more compelling and easier at the same time is just doing you know paint like you just have a photo plate background for your perspective and you paint over there's a lot of artists that use that technique it's not a bad technique you know what i think i want to do too just to add a little bit of something is to suggest i'm getting into my little suggestive mode again just like i was with the tree in background but uh to add some kind of a few of these little pipes in the mist And have fatter and thinner. Some are tapered, some aren't. Like I said, this is this kind of brings me back to my very cartooning days, my cartooning design style. Oh, wrong brush. And like honestly, from from the point that I had kind of everything blocked into this point, I have had zero stress working on this. It's purely just a question of just noodling at that point. Feng Zhu had a very good video on that. He's talking about how, you know, just getting the design, he's talking about the design process and you just get the idea out quick. And then um, at that point, he was talking about how in production, how the stress level just drops. And that's very true. Once, one, of the, one of the major things to do, how much detail and design and, and refinement you push into your pieces is really secondary. Um, that's just a question of choice and time and patience, you know, and the demand of your client if you're doing this professionally. What I uh, really suggest uh, as, a, as a way to really create strong artwork and get over that stress hump, because that's something that we all deal with as professionals, you know, when we're learning the ropes and stuff, it's, um, I'm even gonna do some over the moon here, uh, is how to keep yourself productive, creative, and, and keep that stress level down while you work. And one of the best tricks in the book is to keep your um, keep yourself loose at the beginning. Work loosely. Think. Don't think about the technical quality of your work. Think about the idea first. 
do that, get that out of the way. And try to get that idea in loosely, quickly, and uh, like try to do it in the first 10 minutes. And you'll find that that's a good, like, I, I'm, you'll, you'll notice I'm not, I, I don't do a lot of speed painting stuff. I'm a bit of a, generally speaking, I'm a slower painter. Um, but um, um, my artwork has sped up considerably, you know, uh, just because, here, actually, I'm going to move that down a bit because it's kind of suggesting that the moon is tangenting the sky so that's not right. I have to just show that the, suggest that there's a building below right but yeah um, that gets you over the stress of your idea first getting it out you know getting the client to, to, to okay something or your director to okay something and then you can take it and push it into something refined you know but if you worry about technicalities right away you are bottlenecking yourself into a very stressful situation so you know just uh, start loose, let your imagination flow. You're generating ideas. You are a concept artist. You're the guy who's going to get the, the, the creative wheels turning in a studio, right? That's your job. That's what a concept artist does, confided the job description was accurate, right? And from that point, um, you, can, uh, you can noodle around with details. And noodling around with details is far less stressful than... Uh, than coming up with your idea. The idea really is, people take for granted that the idea really is um, very, very often the hardest part. You know, somebody says, for instance, you know, I remember a client that I had where I did, I did not, it did not turn well. And I, my headspace wasn't in the right place. And, you know, the client, I was lucky enough to have a client who was nice enough to pay me for the work I did, but he didn't keep my design. And I knew it wasn't going to work because it was uh, because of the stress level that I had. I just wasn't in the right headspace when I was working on it. And it was a subject that I was less familiar with. I was doing more kind of more of a sci-fi kind of cyborg type of design and very futuristic. And if you've seen my work, I, I generally have a much more organic twist to my to my work. Uh, it's kind of where my that's my more of my comfort zone. Right. And uh and I'm working on it and I'm going, this isn't going to go well. I know it's not going to go well. And then my stress level starts to come up, you know. And because I regarded at the time what I was doing wrong, if I could share a little bit of, you know, if you could learn from my mistakes, is uh, because I was doing something familiar, my brain immediately went into technical mode, you know. Like, okay, you know, geometric forms and, you know, sharp edges and all this kind of stuff. And I started really putting a lot of pressure on myself to, to, be technically sound and it completely bottlenecked and stunted my creative process so I ended up creating something that was very generic looking and I knew it I looked at it and I went I don't like this <laughs> but I have to give him something so at least you know let's see what he says type of idea you know and he said he was a nice guy he was a super nice guy he said listen Adam you know it's it's really nice work but you know it's not along the lines of what I'm looking for. And I was like, you know, that's totally cool. I understand. And he says, but listen, you know, you worked hard and paid me for it. Um, and and he moved on to another artist who did a, a really nice job, right? <clears throat> I saw his finished product. They look really nice. Um, but, uh, you know what I'm saying? So it's it's it was because I bottlenecked. Now, had I worked, even if I was doing a quote-unquote sci-fi or whatever, I've done a lot of sci-fi since for clients. Uh, or more technical work, uh, which went really well because I allowed myself to stay in my loose organic headspace while concepting it. And I came up with a very rough, rough, loose concept. And then when he said he liked it, to make the translation between a clean and dirty version, like clean up a, a dirty version of something was very easy because the idea was there. Right. And that's what was important. The idea was there and I knew I was on the right track with the character and it was just a question of rendering out surfaces. And, and at that point, it just became a question of refinement. And at that point, applying my knowledge of lighting and rendering to a successful looking character. Right. Rather than trying to jump into the technical before the character was successful yet. You know, and that kind of <clears throat> fleshing out that kind of an idea is uh working that way is a lot easier on your brain and your morale you know but do take into account you know if you're listening and you're you're you've got a little bit less experience or even if you're an experienced artist i i sometimes i find myself teaching this to very experienced artists artists that can paint circles around me you know 
um, because they deal, they, they might be great artists, but when you make learning that personal versus professional work, bridging that gap is a, is a technique in and of itself that you have to flesh out. And I just tell them, it's because you're working on, you, when you, while you're working on this artwork, you're forgetting what you do. You're forgetting how you, you're, you're jumping into technicality too quick. Just have fun and work on the idea, the narrative of this character, and then worry about the um, worry about the, uh, the 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 refinement after, you know. And you know that way, what you can do, you can work on high volume client work and keep your stress level down. And stuff you're producing has a lot more impact. You're going to get a much better response. You know what I mean? And and you know. Very more often than not, that's the kind of advice that I get the most thanks for. You know, I get the biggest smiles for that kind of advice. The technical stuff, bah, everybody's got to learn it, right? But uh, when it comes to stuff like that, who the hell teaches that stuff? You know, where do you get that kind of advice? How do you? It's an emotional thing, and emotional challenges are very often far more difficult to to uh, to address than the technical ones. Because technical ones, you just you know, point A to point B. You know, job done, move on with your life. But when it comes to the emotional sides of things, it can be a real stressor in your career and it can have a lasting impact on your career. And this, in my opinion, is one of the best ways to get over it because I've had to deal with that stuff, you know. We've all had to deal with it, you know. But at the same time, understand that challenge is what it's all about, you know. And that's why painting, that's why artists very often say you got to paint every day and the reason why is because you're dealing with those challenges in private right there's nobody there's no clock the clock isn't ticking you know there's no uh, client sitting there going you know you're taking too long bud you know this is starting to get expensive you better deliver and then when they say you better deliver you're like oh my god my brain just locked up i don't know what i'm doing oh my god this is going to go horrible and then forget it at that point you know unless you got a hell of a lot of discipline then you're gonna you might just botch it you know now you see this little form here? This is inspiring another element I feel it would be cool to integrate, and that's spiky balls. I know a lot of you guys out there are giggling right now hearing me say that. <coughs> spiky balls. I giggle too. I have a few little spikes. So we got the pipes, we got the spikes. I liked it. it. I liked what it looked like, so I thought, ah, that's cool. Right, maybe I can throw some of that around my scene, too. Here. See, everywhere I feel I've got little rounded forms, I can add some purpose to that. That's where working loosely can inspire you, you know? It's not so much about happy accidents. It's about listening to your painting, because your painting will speak back to you, you know? You give it ideas. It gives you ideas back. It generates ideas back and forth, and sometimes it, it you know, it's like it's like the whole speed painting concept where you, um, where you know you find shapes in the clouds type of thing. You know, it's that kind of idea. A little random shape made me think of something, and I just went with it. You know, you can call it artistic improv. You know, an improv you. One of the rules, my daughter takes improv. She's really bloody good at it too, you know? And uh, you're working as a team, right? So it's never about all me. You can always tell those kids that, you know, I went to one of these big shows where these parents and students were being way too over enthusiastic about the show. It was almost like creepy cult-like enthusiastic. I was like, Jesus, man. Why, you know, the fact that I'm not jumping up and screaming and cheering, you know, and, and that the fact that I know all of these kind of inside chants that these people were going on, you know, going on about, because they've been doing it for the last 10 years, kind of felt left out, but, you know, uh, you can always tell that one, stu that one, you know, improv participant who's, who's all about me, 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 you know, because every time her fricking lines would come up or every time it was her chance to speak, she'd walk right up to the front of the stage and have a dominating presence and, you know, use all those techniques that, you know, her teach her acting coach gave her. And I'm, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, that's great. You know what? Your technique is fantastic, but you've kind of forgotten about the fact that you, there's 30 other kids sitting behind you waiting for their lines. You know, you might want to chill out a little bit and stop being such a show off, you know? Well, 
But it's improv, and the whole principle behind improv is you never say that's dumb, or you never change the subject. You always have to go with it. You know, like the Adam Sandler film, just go with it, right? You always have to. If the answer you give is always yes and, it's never no, because no blocks creativity. It blocks original thought processes, right? So, um, it, it kills spontaneity as well. And that translates, that can easily translate directly into, uh, into concepting like this. I do an idea. If I don't like it, I paint over it. You know what I mean? But if I, if there's an idea and I go, Oh, cool, go with it, you know, and build on it. And you keep your, that way you're keeping your creative process very, um, very energetic. You're keeping a lot of movement going on in your piece and keep making it a lot more fun, you know? And it's also, it allows you to, to elaborate on design ideas that you might not have thought of, thought of. And it allows you to break out of your comfort zone in terms of design, because very often we have a tendency as artists to paint the things that we know work. You know, we just happen to fall on something through over the lines of the years we've been painting, and we have a tendency to reuse those ideas and go with it all and keep using that same idea over and over and over again. Where working like this allows you the ability to break that mold very quickly, you know, and and go, ah, here's another idea I, that works, and here's another idea that works. And if you make a practice of working like that regularly, it um, that whole idea library expands very fast, you know. And you learn to just be spontaneous with your ideas. You learn to be spontaneous with 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 uh, with your whole process, and allow yourself to just allow ideas to flow. Look at any major studio that you know about. You know, very often, you know, like if you look at concept art for Pixar, you know, a very good example is Pixar. Um, look at their work. Some of the work is ridiculously loose. I mean, you think this is loose? It's ten times looser than this. But man, it's fun, you know? There's so much fun and creativity injected into the work. Why? Because they're working like this. Because they're very improv with their ideas. You can tell when they sit down and brainstorm ideas as a team, they, uh, they just go, they just have fun. They just let loose and, and have fun with their ideas. And, uh, and they improv it. There is a lot of improv going on. I remember even there was one that you can actually find it on YouTube. If I find it, I'll post it on my forum. It's, um, I think it would be pretty easy to find, actually, if I'm not mistaken. It's a guy from Disney or Pixar. I think it was Pixar. And he's teaching kids how to story tell, right? It's brilliant. And he takes them through the, these, these high school kids, he takes them through the entire process of what they do at Pixar to generate ideas. I'm telling you, this is a, this is a, a, it's valuable information for guys like you and me, you know? Um, and he teaches, he, he's teaching, he shows you, you can see it all on, on the video. He, he takes them all through the steps of how to produce an original fun idea. And it really works. And I'm telling you, it's 99% based on purely on improv. Just going with it, allowing yourself to just be carefree with your ideas, you know? And, and taking an idea, going with it, building on it, building on it, building on it, building on it, just go, 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 you know, moving, constantly moving forward with your thought process. You're not sitting there, sitting back and questioning yourself every two seconds. And that's, honestly, that's what it's all about. Like I've, I've quoted this a thousand times, you're probably getting sick of me saying it, but like Chuck Jones said, never underestimate the power of the spontaneous thought. You know, how many ideas brilliant ideas out that are out there for films you've seen, TV shows you've seen, cartoon characters, concept pieces that were all based on that artist just going, oh, that's cool. And then having the knowledge to actually work on fleshing it out, doing something with it, you know? It's, it isn't more complicated than that. And have faith in your artistic your, to have faith in your uh, in your skills as an artist, you know, uh, your ability to um, have faith in your ability to make something work out of nothing, you know, but 
before you can make anything work, that original initial idea, that idea that you that you did, that you created, has to be something fun and neat. And once you've done that, whether it's a serious subject or not, you know, you want it to be something compelling. But once you have that subject, keep going with it, keep going with it. And you know, trust your standards. Your, you know how you can look at somebody else's work and immediately see what doesn't work and what could be used, what could be done to fix it. <clears throat> Do the same thing with yourself, you know. Give yourself a chance. Work on something. Build on what started off as a trivial, trivial two-second spontaneous thought and just go with it and, and build on it. You'll know within the first 10 seconds if you're bottlenecking yourself into a headache or if you actually, if you give it a little bit of attention, you might be able to make something cool out of it, you know. Trust yourself. You'll make it work, you know, if you're, if you fleshed out an idea and you've got something cool to start yourself with, uh, you can make it work. And you can make it look nice too, but you can't, like, 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 one of my favorite singers out there, like, um, uh, favorite singer, but I can't remember his name. Oh, for God's sakes. I'm going to pause the video so I can look it up. Tom Waits. Like, uh, Tom Waits uh, says, how many ways can you polish up a turd, right? It's from his uh, song, Hell Broke Loose. I love that line. How many ways can you polish up a turd? That's true. If it's a turd, if you can polish it up as much as you want, it's still going to be a turd, <laughs> right? But if it's something cool, then you can work, on, and then you can make it work. And trust yourself. Trust that. Trust your ability to do that. Don't don't think, oh, it sucks because I'm no good. It doesn't suck because I'm no good. It sucks because because you uh, you didn't you didn't have a that that ten minutes of coming up with a good idea wasn't done. It, you were too tight. You were too hard on yourself. Loosen up. Be fun with it. You know. What's a good example? What would my daughter say if she looked at it? I want a big butterfly. And you go, okay, thanks, sweetie. You know, <laughs> you know. And what does that mean? Fuck it. You know what? Let's put a butterfly in here. Let's put a steampunk butterfly into this painting. And you know what? Because it's a butterfly, people are gonna go, oh, that's so out of context. That's so cool. I love your butter. And people are gonna say, oh, I love your butterfly. Just watch, okay? Because it doesn't belong. <laughs> it's going to be a steampunk butterfly that's sitting somewhere floating through the air. I'm going to have, do I want him flying through the air or steampunk butterfly? Where do I put my butterfly? What have I gotten myself into? The butterfly will be sitting here. Let me just look up a quick image reference of a butterfly perched on. All right, I got an image of a uh, monarch butterfly here. It's a nice pose. Something I can start with. You'd think I have a butterfly moth fetish because my my tree and piece I just did a butterfly. This actually I haven't done a lot of a whole lot of butterflies. This is me doing a little a little improv with my piece. Now by depending on the size of my butterfly, I'm also suggesting just how close this uh, this thing is, right? If we see a big butterfly, we're going to assume that this these pipes are right in front of our face. So depending on how big this butterfly is, now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of glancing over just to kind of quickly get a silhouette directly from my image reference, but then I'm going to steampunk it up a little bit and make it a little bit more interesting. People love out of context, you know. That's why one of the things I love about being a dad, because you're always being, you're always surrounded by creative kids who just, I so so admire children's ability to just, um, just be crazy, you know. Do something a little nuts, go crazy with it. They're not afraid to be silly, and when they paint it, when you when I watch my five-year-old daughter paint, she paints her thoughts. You know, is she technically sound? Does she have professional backing? Is she, you know, 
is she, is she using such and such a technique? What's her color? She, she couldn't give her. She, she couldn't give a rat's ass what her color techniques like. And I love. And I love that. You know, um, like the expression goes, learn the technicalities. This is another. I'm quoting um, Chuck Jones again here. Learn the technicalities of art to the point where you can ultimately forget them. Because I mean, look, l l learn the technicalities of drawing and painting until you can ultimately forget them. And once you once you're comfortable enough with the technicalities, you can forget about the technicalities and start producing the real thing, i.e., art. Right? <clears throat> uh, every you've got to learn those techniques. You got to learn those tricks and techniques. You have to practice and learn how to you know get some hand control in there and you know learn how to get loose with color. Learn how to you know inject believability into your work that type of idea but once you've once all once you've practiced that enough it just becomes pure second nature to you it's just kind of a default you know and you just keep referencing back and forth between different ideas different practices you kind of bring them all together into a piece of artwork and before you know it you got something cool going on right but forget about the technicalities. And kids don't couldn't give a rat's ass about technicalities. In fact, if you try to bug them with technicalities, they get pissed off at you. It's my drawing, Daddy. Leave me alone. Yeah, but the the, the arm's too long. I don't give a shit. <laughs> no, my daughter doesn't swear yet, but um, she will hopefully one day. But you know what I mean? She uh, she just paints, and and I learn so much from watching my kids paint because they're just they're just carefree, and you know bringing that into my own work and just going with a crazy idea like this, you know, I said the word butterfly. Okay. Butterfly it is. Let's go. The fact that I never would have, if I was thinking technically, I was like, Oh, a character with these goggles and this and that. And no, 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 screw that. Just do a steampunk butterfly. How many steampunk butterflies have we seen out there? You know, it's a cool idea, man. Go with it. And it's so out of context that you, you know, that few people have probably tackled this challenge and, Tried to do something cool with it, so oh, I didn't want to cut that out. Or how does it look actually? If I do cut it out, it's something kind of interesting. Oh, come on, don't crash on me. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna keep that hollow, kind of like what happened. There's a happy accident for you. Okay, now. It's going to have these cool long antenna. Antennae. Antennae. Notice that this is 99.9% .9 uh, uh, lasso tool. And I'm thinking all in terms of silhouette. I'm constantly thinking silhouette, 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 and volumes. Now let's add some cogwheels to this bad boy. Now we're hitting on 41 minutes, so I'm going to have to stop this video soon-ish, Lee. And it's going to be a slightly off-kilter cogwheel. You know when you generate your best ideas? I know when I generated my best ideas. My whole life was when I'd sit down with my friend Jimmy, my best friend, my bestest best friend, and uh, one of my fa one of both of our favorite things to do in the world is just hook up, go to a coffee shop, and just shoot the shit for hours, have our bitch and slurp, you know. And uh, I'll do a couple actually, and. We're both artists, right? He's a comic, he's a graphic novel artist, and I'm a, more of a cartoonist, concept artist, painter, whatever. I, I don't know what the hell I am, but I I draw, I do drawings. But um, we we could sit there, we could honestly loiter in a restaurant or a cafe for hours and hours and just laugh and you know, goof off, and we were just, con we were, basically, it was like, we'd, we sit down together and narrate a movie, you know, 
for hours and hours and hours and laugh and just have fun and all that fun stuff, you know. And I can tell you honestly, one of the reasons why we enjoyed being hanging out so much together and doing that together is because we're just constantly generating, we're just being creative, we're doing what we love most, you know. Just coming up with all these silly, crazy ideas because there's no, where's the, where's the pressure, right? It's just us, we're just goofing off, just a couple of guys, you know, laughing and, you know, having, going through 12 cups of coffee over the space of six hours, you know, and it's just creatively fun. And I come, I swear to you, man, you know, I come home from one of our bitch and slip sessions and I am, I feel like I've, I've been at a, you know, a six hour comedy festival. I'm just so freaking Zen and satisfied and happy. And I'm just in such an awesome mood, relaxed, no stress, no worries. Just, I just feel, ah, like I took a walk through the mountain type of thing, you know, and in the fresh air, I spent the day at the beach. Honestly, I, I, it's, it's, I love that as much as I love a day at the beach, if not more. It's just so awesome, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, it's because we're just being so creatively, having so much fun and just, and that's the thing, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, letting go, letting go, learn to let go. Don't take yourself so, don't take your work so seriously. If you take your work too seriously, uh, you get really, really pent up and that's when crap happens, you know, that's when you get all stressed out and don't, there's no reason to, man. Just, if you can let yourself go, you're working in a much more emotionally comfortable situation you're creating more work. You're getting more praise for your creative ideas. Take it from somebody who's, you know, who's screwed up his share of times. You know, disappointed clients. I've I've been through that whole thing. I know what it's all about. And you're not alone if you've been through that. You know, we've all we've all screwed up. all good. I hear you, brother and sister. I think I need a third type of cogwheel just to mix it up a little bit. And if you're asking yourself, well, yeah, but Adam, how are you coming up with these ideas? I'm coming up with these ideas by immediately reacting to a thought. I don't hesitate. You know, you have those thoughts too. I have no more creative ability than you do. In fact, you might be able to, you know, sing and dance or circles around me when it comes to this kind of stuff. But what I do know is I've learned to listen to my, listen to my brain immediately. I don't let ideas, you know, fade away. I grab them, I try them, you know, and I trust my intuition. And you got to do the same thing with you. If you can learn to trust your intuition as an artist, you're going to be able to produce stuff really, really quickly, you know. You're going to be able to come up with ideas you didn't even know you had in you. And when you get your creative juices flowing, you, um, you generate stuff that's 10 times better, you know. And your design, your aesthetics, the quote unquote aesthetics of your artwork uh, become secondary to you. You know, you know how to make something look pretty. You're an artist. That's, that's, that's why you do what you do. Trust your ability. Don't, you don't have to overthink making things look pretty. That'll come by itself. Trust that part of yourself. Just worry about your idea. 
and don't say no to yourself. But what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? I draw out this butterfly, right? And it sucks. So what if it sucks? <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. Am I going to get arrested? No. Who gives a shit? Paint the damn thing. Yeah. Go for it. Just do it. And I think this, from what I can see, what I feel by looking at this, if I pull it off successfully, then I think, I feel it's going to be a detail that people are going to appreciate, you know? A little Easter egg. Everything's very loose, but then we have this really cool little geary uh, butterfly sitting in here, you know? Now, the cool thing about spontaneous thought, too, and, and working spontaneously, being an artistic improv artist, is the faster you think, the more quickly you just generate ideas and you just let them go, you just go with your idea, um, the harder it is to rip other people off. You know what I mean? What I mean by ripping other people off is like just kind of like being overly influenced by other people's artwork. It prevents you from being able to do that to a certain degree because you're you're only listening to your inner voice, right? And because you you think best when you think fast, you know, when you just go with ideas, uh, that's actually when you'll you'll probably find when your your most um, your your creativity is is very personal at that point. So go with that idea, you know, trust that part of yourself. And you're going to see that it's a lot easier to come up with great ideas than you thought. It's not as stressful or difficult. It's just a question of being a good listener as an artist. And not only to other people, but to yourself too. And that falls into the whole getting to know yourself part of art, right? It's kind of cool. I don't mind it. You see, you can barely see it in the the big when we look at the big picture of things. It's just a little detail. But when people go in, they're gonna go, oh, "Yo, check out that, check out that butterfly. Look at all the details on that butterfly, right?" I'm gonna keep him more or less in silhouette, but I want a little bit of light to him. I'm, I'll try. I like him in silhouette like that. I like the suggestion of the silhouette. Yeah, I was going to mention before that, um, you know, in this particular piece, this most of this piece is very loose, as you've seen. I've, I've very quick. I just whip in details very quickly, you know, and very unrefined and stuff. But by suggest by adding one element that has that little bit more attention, um, when your viewers are are reg are are, reg are studying your piece and looking at your piece. Uh, and they put this butterfly, for instance, in the context of the overall piece, <clears throat> this detail translates into everything else. So it kind of, it actually, one little element can really boost the quality of your overall piece <clears throat> very quickly. Because just, just purely through association, the fact that this the fact that this butterfly is a part of the rest of the scene um, uh, sorry I'm losing I'm concentrating here uh, in the context of the scene people because people have the opportunity to come up close and nerd out over a certain detail um, it helps people enjoy the, the it helps people appreciate your overall piece of artwork does this mean you have to add that kind of level of detail to everything absolutely not you know, if I add this level of detail to everything in my scene, I would spend weeks and weeks and weeks working on it. And this is a piece I want to keep it quick and short and loose and fun. You know, that's why I keep saying, that's my mantra for this piece. So if I get too bogged down on details, then I'm, I'm, you know, overall, then I've completely changed the dynamic of this piece of artwork. So that's not where I want to go with this. I want to keep it very lighthearted, but have a little Easter egg in there for people to enjoy. Just a 
little suggestion of some volume. You'll hardly even see it. You have to look up close. We, if we see this in large scale, if I was to print this large, the butterfly would be about that big. But I'm going to be careful not to create too much of a tangent there. There, like that. Even smaller. See, not many people are going to be able to come up this close and see it from this close, but they'll get the idea. I want to get the idea out there. Now, I could draw a little bit more attention to it by boosting up the value, creating a little bit more contrast, perhaps, or adding a bit ah, a bit more of a red. Let's lean it up. Let's give it a little bit of red, or a kind of a rusty orangey red. That should help grab a little bit more attention, just so he's not completely obsolete, you know? shadow, show a little bit of volume. Oh yeah, November 7th, that means today is BlizzCon for all you WoW players and StarCraft players and Diablo players. I'm personally not going to get that virtual ticket thing because I know that you know by tomorrow most of it's going to be posted online anyways. I don't get people who spend, you know, thousands of dollars to buy a plane ticket and all that stuff. Why bother? I don't know. If you're into that kind of stuff, cool. I personally don't feel like spending thousands of dollars on a ticket when I know I can get it online. You know, I'll wait a day. <laughs> I'm not going to fly all the way down, down to the States. just to help him grab a little bit of attention. Now, does that kill his silhouette? Or is he stronger as... No. Okay, that's cool. All right, we're doing good. 